Strodes. Your daily commute is making you miserable, and it's not by accident. The Strode is that nightmare combination of street and road, wide enough for highway speeds but cluttered with traffic lights every few hundred feet, or about 200 meters. You've driven on thousands of these without knowing they had a name. They're designed for cars to move fast, but also for businesses to have access. The result? They fail at both. Traffic moves slowly because of constant stops, and it's dangerous for pedestrians trying to cross six lanes. Orlando's International Drive has more pedestrian fatalities per mile than almost anywhere in America. That's your strode in action. You're doing 50 miles per hour, about 80 kilometers per hour. One second and slamming your brakes the next. Strodes are everywhere because planners thought they could combine highway efficiency with local access. Instead, they created the worst of both worlds. The six-lane monstrosity outside your local Walmart, a classic strode, wide enough to feel like a highway, but interrupted every block by driveways and traffic signals. Emergency vehicles get stuck in the same traffic as everyone else. Businesses struggle because customers can't safely walk between stores, even when they're right next to each other. Parking craters. Remember when downtowns had buildings instead of parking lots? Meet the parking crater, where vibrant city blocks went to die. Buffalo lost 40% of its downtown buildings to parking between 1950 and 2000. That's not urban renewal, that's urban demolition. These craters destroy the street life that makes cities interesting. You can't window shop at a parking lot. You can't grab coffee from a parking space. The crater creates a dead zone where community used to exist. And here's the kicker. Most downtowns have more parking spaces than cars. We demolished our cities for parking we didn't even need. Walk through any American downtown and count the surface lots. You'll find more asphalt than architecture. The parking crater turns vibrant neighborhoods into commuter storage facilities. Business owners demand parking, then wonder why nobody walks to their stores anymore. Detroit has enough downtown parking to accommodate twice its current population. Meanwhile, property taxes drop because parking lots generate less revenue than buildings. Cities literally tear down their tax base to create free storage for suburban commuters who drive in, park, and leave without spending money locally. Car suburbs. Then there's the car suburb, where you literally cannot survive without a car. Phoenix sprawls 500 square miles, nearly 1,300 square kilometers, with a population density so low that buses can't run efficiently. The average suburban household spends $9,000 per year just on car ownership. That's a mortgage payment going to transportation. Kids can't bike to school because there are no sidewalks. Elderly people become prisoners when they can't drive anymore. The design forces car dependency, then punishes anyone who can't afford a car. It's social engineering disguised as housing policy. Want milk? Drive to the store. Need a haircut? Drive across town. Kids want to see friends. Mom becomes an unpaid taxi driver. The suburb promises freedom, but delivers isolation. Every trip requires a car. Every car requires insurance, gas, maintenance, and parking. The American dream became an expensive nightmare for anyone who can't afford a car or is unable to drive. Suburban design assumes infinite cheap oil and perfect health until age 80. When gas prices spike or someone loses their license, the whole system collapses. The infrastructure costs are astronomical too. All those wide streets, water pipes, and power lines spread across vast distances cost three times more per resident than dense neighborhoods. Dead plazas. Ever wonder why some public squares buzz with life while others feel like abandoned movie sets? Welcome to the dead plaza phenomenon. These are the windswept concrete wastelands that planners thought would create civic grandeur. Boston's City Hall Plaza covers 11 acres, about 4.5 hectares, and feels empty even during events. The problem? No shops, no cafes, no reason to linger, just concrete and wind. Compare that to Italian piazzas surrounded by restaurants and shops. People need reasons to visit spaces, not just space to visit. The dead plaza ignores how humans actually use public space. We don't gather in empty concrete fields, we gather around activity. A successful plaza needs coffee shops, restaurants, maybe a newsstand. Instead, we get modernist sculptures and benches facing nothing. Urban planners created outdoor rooms with no furniture and wondered why nobody sits down. The dead plaza represents the triumph of architectural theory over human behavior. Planners read about grand civic spaces in textbooks, but forgot that those spaces worked because they were surrounded by commerce and daily life. Highway cuts. Highway cuts are where planners literally sliced cities in half for cars. Interstate 75 destroyed entire neighborhoods in Detroit. The Embarcadero Freeway walled off San Francisco from its waterfront for decades. 
These highways don't just divide space, they divide communities. It was no accident. Low-income neighborhoods usually got the highway slicing through them, while wealthy neighborhoods got the bypass. The result? Environmental inequality written in concrete and asphalt. Highway cuts created noise, pollution, and physical barriers that split families from jobs, schools, and services. When San Francisco finally tore down the Embarcadero Freeway, property values increased by $3 billion. Turns out cities work better when they are not split down the middle. The highway cut represents the moment planners chose car mobility over community cohesion. Entire districts vanished overnight to make room for commuters passing through. In St. Paul, the construction of Interstate 94 displaced 600 families and 300 businesses, mostly in the African-American community. The highway didn't connect the neighborhood, it erased it. These cuts created permanent scars that still define American cities decades later. drive throughs drive throughs seem convenient until you realize they've redesigned entire streetscapes around car windows. The average McDonald's drive through takes up more space than the restaurant itself. These create dead zones for pedestrians. Try walking past a Starbucks drive through without feeling like you're trespassing. Cities start catering to car passengers instead of residents. The drive through bank, drive through pharmacy, even drive through funeral homes. We've designed cities where you never need to leave your car, which means you never interact with your community. Buildings turn their backs to the street to face the drive through lane. Sidewalks disappear because customers arrive by car. The drive through optimizes for speed, but eliminates the spontaneous encounters that make neighborhoods feel alive. You get your coffee without seeing another human face. The drive through lane wraps around buildings like a moat, creating a barrier between the business and any pedestrians brave enough to walk by. What used to be the front door becomes a service entrance while the real action faces the parking lot. Cul-de-sacs promise peace and quiet, but deliver isolation and emergency nightmares. Fire trucks struggle to navigate these dead-end streets. Ambulances get lost in maze-like subdivisions. Kids can't walk or bike anywhere because every trip requires entering high-speed arterial roads. The design that was supposed to protect children from traffic actually makes them more car-dependent. And despite claims about safety, studies show cul-de-sac neighborhoods have higher rates of childhood obesity because kids can't walk anywhere independently. The cul-de-sac creates a hierarchy of streets, quiet dead ends feeding into busy collectors, feeding into dangerous arterials. Residents become trapped in a system where leaving the neighborhood requires navigating increasingly hostile infrastructure. The peace and quiet comes at the cost of connection and mobility. Emergency response times increase because vehicles must navigate the maze to reach houses. Snow plows and garbage trucks struggle with the tight turning circles. The cul-de-sac promises suburban tranquility, but creates a car-dependent prison where every destination requires a coordinated vehicle expedition. One way's streets turn drivers into pinballs bouncing through downtown. You overshoot your destination and spend 10 minutes circling back. Louisville converted its downtown from two-way to one-way streets in the 1960s, then spent $40 million converting them back when they realized one-way's eliminated street life. Faster traffic sounds good until you realize pedestrians can't cross safely and businesses lose customers who can't figure out how to reach them. One-ways optimize traffic flow at the expense of everything else that makes cities livable. They create confusion for visitors, reduce foot traffic for businesses, and make neighborhoods feel like highway on-ramps. The one-way street prioritizes car throughput over human activity. Downtowns become traffic sewers instead of community centers. Speed increases, but so does the danger for everyone not in a car. One-way streets create a psychological barrier too. They signal that a place is meant for passing through, not stopping. Businesses struggle because half their potential customers can't easily reach them. The faster traffic makes crossing more dangerous for pedestrians, creating an additional barrier to foot traffic. I'm incredibly happy that we've become such a wonderful community so quickly, and I'm so thankful for every valuable comment you've left on the previous videos. To help us grow even more, please like this video and subscribe. See you in the next one.